let's take the discussion one step further. Now that we know our best guess for what that theta parameter is of our probability distribution, we also have a good guess of how far off our MLE might be from theta. Can we come up with a range of values for theta that are plausible based on the data that we've collected? The answer is yes, we're gonna call that range of values a confidence interval for theta. And so how can we come up with this range of values? How can we come up with a confidence interval for theta based on the sample that we've collected and the MLE that we've measured? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to exploit the theoretical properties of the sampling distribution of our maximum likelihood estimate. We know that for relatively large samples, the sampling distribution of the MLE the possible values of the MLE that we might measure when we go and collect data, it has a normal distribution. The peak of that normal distribution is theta, the true value of the probability parameter here, and with the standard deviation that we can calculate from the Fisher information. And so to get this confidence interval, what we're going to do is exploit what we know about the normal distribution and values from it. So the empirical rule says that about 68% of values from a normal distribution are within one standard deviation of the peak. About 95% of values we get from a normal distribution are within two standard deviations of the peak. So if the sampling distribution of our MLE does have a normal distribution, we can put some pretty strong probabilistic bounds about how far off our estimated MLE is, our theta hat, is from the true value of theta. And so we can use this empirical rule to come up with a confidence interval for theta, the true value of that parameter that's generating our data. Since we know that 95% of the time, we're going to observe an MLE, a theta hat, that's within plus or minus two standard deviations of theta, we can kind of flip that statement on its head and say that based on the one value of theta hat that I've measured for my sample, if I go plus or minus two standard errors away from that, well, that interval should have about a 95% chance of covering theta. If I want different chances, I can call that my level of confidence associated with that interval. I can use the QNorm function to figure out how many standard errors that I need to go away from theta hat, but it's a relatively trivial process. And so I can come up with a master formula for how to come up with a confidence interval for theta based on the sample values that I've collected and the MLE that I've calculated from them. So for any level of confidence that you have in mind, 90%, 99%, 95% is the fiducial value, what we can do is we can figure out how many standard errors we need to go from our MLE so that we have an interval that has a certain chance of covering the true value of theta. We can get that number of standard errors by referencing QNorm, putting in our desired level of confidence. For 95% confidence, that fiducial value, that's just going to be a 2. And that range of values is what we're going to call our confidence interval. We can say we're 95% confident that theta is inside the interval theta hat plus or minus two standard errors. Now, we want to be a little bit careful here. This has an approximate confidence level of 95%. Why should we say approximate 95% confidence interval? Well, it's because there's actually a lot of approximations involved in this statement. So number one, we were using the empirical rule, which is a rule about normal distributions, to help develop this formula. But the sampling distribution of the MLE, the sampling distribution of theta hat, isn't exactly normal. It's just pretty close. So it's approximately normal. So whenever we talk about confidence levels of our intervals, it has a confidence level that's only approximately 95% or 99%. And then also our formula for that standard error, well, we kind of had to guess at that. We had to plug in the value that we measured from the sample itself, that MLE, into that formula for the Fisher information. And so since we're having to guess at what that standard deviation is of that normal curve, there's a second layer of approximation that we have to take into account. And so when we do use our master formulas for these confidence intervals, these are confidence intervals that have approximately the level of confidence specified. So an approximate 95% confidence interval for theta would be your theta hat plus or minus two standard errors. 
And so where do we get those standard errors from? Well, we can math it out with the Fisher information. So we can write our master formula for the confidence interval in terms of that Fisher information evaluated at the theta equal to the MLE estimate. Or we can just use FitDist and just read off that standard error from the output of FitDist. So one caveat to this discussion is that that master formula doesn't apply to every probability distribution out there. So number one, this formula is not going to apply when that parameter you're trying to estimate, your theta parameter, actually influences the range of values that you might observe. So the uniform distribution between zero and some upper bound theta, it turns out that this formula doesn't really quite cut it for coming up with a 95% confidence interval for theta in that case. But for most cases out there, as long as theta isn't tied in to the possible values of x you might observe, then you're going to be good to go. Just always be looking at the definition of your PDF and know that when you see x being tied in to theta inside of a range, you're not going to be able to use this procedure here. Now, the other thing is, is that these are all asymptotic results. The sampling distribution of the MLE is only approximately normal when we're talking about really large samples. Now, large really isn't all that large. More than about 25 data points or so, you should be okay. The level of approximation gets better and better with the more data that you have. Now, before we close this discussion, it's very important to revisit and talk about what we mean by confidence in the confidence interval. What does that actually refer to? Well, number one, and this is what most people are tempted to interpret confidence as, most people want to say that the confidence of a confidence interval is the probability that theta is going to be inside that interval. And that could not be farther from the truth. If you think way back to when we discussed probability, we talked about how probability isn't used to quantify our ignorance about reality. So theta is some number, we just don't know what it is. So it doesn't make sense to talk about the probability that theta is inside some sort of range of values. It either is or it isn't, we don't know what it is. We don't use the word probability to quantify our ignorance about the world. However, confidence is some sort of probability, but what probability is it in reference to? What event is it describing? Well, if we think back to our master formula, the master formula for the confidence interval of the MLE said to take your theta hat and then go plus or minus two standard errors for 95% confidence. Well, theta hat is a random quantity. It's going to depend on the sample values that you measure. And so is the standard error of theta hat. That's going to depend on the specific set of values that you collect. So when we take that theta hat plus or minus two theta hat, that procedure of constructing that interval that's going to be the random quantity that the confidence describes the probability of either being correct or not. So this is what confidence really refers to. It refers to the probability that our procedure of taking our MLE estimate and then going plus or minus two standard errors away, the probability that that procedure ends up with a range of values that covers theta. So when we talk about the confidence in a confidence interval, we're talking about the probability that the procedure that's making that confidence interval actually ends up you know, covering the true value of theta. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And so to illustrate that, let's consider the following simulation. Let's imagine we have a big intro stat class of 100 students, and we're going to have them each generate a random sample of size 100 from a normal distribution with a mu equal to 5 and a sigma equal to 2. And we're going to have each one of these 100 students go through that procedure of coming up with a 95% confidence interval for the mu parameter. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the confidence intervals of all 100 of those students. When we talk about confidence, we talk about the probability that the procedure ends up producing a range of values that covers uh, the true value of the parameter. What we'll see is that if we look at these confidence intervals graphically, so up and down gives you the range of values that's contained in the confidence interval. Left to right, we're just going from student one to student two, student three, et cetera. The horizontal line is drawn at mu equal to five, the true value of mu. And we see that sometimes the confidence intervals get it right, all of those intervals that are color-coded black. Some of those confidence intervals miss it. The range of values that end up getting produced don't contain mu equal to five. And so those are color-coded red. Those are the ones that got it wrong. 
being 95% in a confidence interval means that there's a 95% chance that that procedure in the long run is going to produce an interval that covers the true value of that uh, probability model. So one worked example before we conclude, let's talk about the Jackson distribution. So this isn't really the Jackson distribution. This has another name. You could go Wikipedia at this, but let's call it Jackson anyway for illustration. So we have the following formula for the PDF of a Jackson distribution. It's right skewed. It has only positive values, and it depends on one unknown parameter, theta. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to come up with a way to estimate theta from a random sample of data values, get the MLE, and then also figure out how far off my MLE might be and then come up with a 95% confidence interval for that value of theta based on my sample. So if I wanted to do it the math way, well, I could figure out the likelihood of my random sample. So I could take my n copies of the formula for the PDF, multiply all those together, replacing those x's with the x1, the x2, etc. Group all the terms together so that I got a nice compact expression for the likelihood. The product of all the x's in my random sample divided by theta raised to the n power times e raised to the minus 1 over 2 theta times the sum of the squares of all of the x's that I've collected. So where does that likelihood peak? Where is the slope of the tangent line of that likelihood equal to 0? Well, we can ask Wolfram Alpha, and Wolfram Alpha will say, okay, well, this is going to peak at a value of s over 2n. Now, in my expression, I abbreviated the sum of the squares of all the x's by s, so s over 2n just means to take the sum of all the squared values of my data and divide by 2n. All right, so my MLE estimate got that done. How far off do I think my MLE is actually going to be from theta? What's going to be the standard error? All right, well, if I want to math that out, what I need to do is go and figure out the Fisher information. So I can write out the formula for the logarithm of my expression for the PDF. I can take the derivative of that expression with respect to theta, take that expression, take the derivative once again to get the second derivative. That gives me some expression, some function, whose expected value I need to compute. So I'll transcribe the formula for this function, multiply that by my transcription of the formula for the PDF, and then since x is a continuous random variable, I'm going to integrate that over all possible values of x that I might see. So asking Wolfram well, Alpha to perform that integral, what I find is that the Fisher information is 1 over theta squared. So I have to flip the sign of whatever expression I get out from that integral. So the Fisher information, 1 over theta squared. And so I'm almost there in terms of figuring out what the formula for my standard error is going to be. So in general, my formula for the standard error is going to be 1 over the square root of n, that sample size, times my expression for the Fisher information, where I replace theta with my MLE estimate. And so I can take that expression for the Fisher information and plug that into my formula for the standard error. Standard error is just 1 over the square root of n times the Fisher information evaluated at theta equal to the MLE. And going through the math simplifying, I find that my formula for the standard error is just theta hat over the square root of n. So what was theta hat? That was just the sum of the squares of all the data values that I collected divided by 2n. So I have a formula for the standard error of my estimate as well. Take the sum of the squares of all the x's I collected and divide by 2 times n raised to the 3 halves power. So I have all I need to know. If I have a random sample from this Jackson distribution, I can come up with the MLE estimate of what theta is, and I can come up with the value for the standard error, how far off I think my estimate is away from the true value of theta. So obviously the math way, pretty involved here. If we actually do have the data values in front of us, let's generate a random sample from the Jackson distribution. Getting the standard error, getting the MLE is just as easy as running fit dist. So what I can do is first plug in the data values into my expressions to write the mathematical way for the MLE and its standard error to get the following two numbers, and then just double check to see, all right, does FitDist give me the same set of values? And they do. Uh, defining D Jackson, transcribing the formula for the Jackson distribution, throwing that into FitDist, using it as a starting value, just theta equal to 5, we just need something to get it started. We find that we recover the same values of the MLE and also the standard error. So if I wanted a 95% confidence interval for theta of that Jackson distribution that's generating my data, I'll take my theta hat plus or minus two standard errors. And so I'd find that a 95% confidence interval for theta in this case is the values between 4 and 9.2. 
Once again, that 95% confidence doesn't mean that there's a 95% chance that theta is inside this interval. It either is or it isn't. I just don't know what that answer is. I don't use probability to quantify my ignorance about the world. All I know is that this procedure, taking theta hat plus or minus two uh, standard errors, that procedure that generates that range of values in the long run has a 95% chance of coming up with a range of values that covers theta. So a follow-up question would be to ask, well, what's the achieved level of confidence with this procedure? I designed it to have approximately 95% confidence. So in the long run, when I do use this procedure, how often does that interval actually contain the true value of theta? Well, let's run a Monte Carlo simulation. Let's go and actually generate a whole bunch of different random samples from this Jackson di distribution. Let's do 10,000 of those, and then get the MLEs and standard errors for each of those. Construct the confidence intervals for each of those random samples, and see what fraction of those confidence intervals actually do cover the true value of theta, which I'm going to have as uh, equal to 5 in this case. And what I find that after 10,000 random samples is that just about 95%, 93.5% to be precise in this case, actually do cover the true value of theta, 5 in this case. And so I am indeed achieving approximately 95% confidence with my procedure.